So, Professor, I mean, what is, what is the big common misconception about population and wealth? And I how can you tell us about it? I think it's that the big change that has occurred has not entered into people's mind. Let me show you how the world was 50 years ago when I came as a teenager to London for the first time. Then the poorest people in the world, they lived on $1 a day. Then there was those who lived on $10 and more a day. At that time, we were 3 billion people in the world. One, or oh, let me put them like this. Each of these is 1 billion people. There were 2 billion people in the developing world. They were living on almost $1 a day. And then there was 1 billion in the West, uh, North America, Europe, Japan. And they were living on a little more than $10. So there was a huge gap. They had long life and small families. They had short life and large families. And this was the big divide that emerged out of the Industrial Revolution. But now the world has changed. Now, 50 years later, this group, the West, they have grown much richer. They are on $100 a day. And then we got 4 billion more people in the world. Now, still, unfortunately, 1 billion is still on this level. This billion is more up here. The average is below, slightly below $10 a day. And there is one squeezed in here between. And then we have people who live here and we have people, the better off in China, in Turkey, in Brazil, they live here. Look, today we have people on all levels, from Congo down there to Japan and, 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 and West Europe up here. And this is what hasn't been understood. So the world is much better off than people think. It is, yes. And if you look at things like population, the number of children in the world have stopped increasing. So let me tell you how many children are born per woman here. Here it's two, like in, in, in UK and in Sweden. Down here, like in Congo and Afghanistan, it's five. That is the extreme. But here it's two, 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 three. Eighty percent of the world population use contraceptives and have two child families. Eighty percent vaccinate their children. Ninety percent of the girls go to school and 80 percent have electricity at home. So the vast majority, almost six out of seven, have a decent life. This is unacceptable extreme poverty. OK, but the big story at the moment in terms of population, if we look at the world map, is population movement, refugees. That is the crisis of the moment. What can you tell us about? Well, I agree that population movement is the big thing, but the biggest thing is urbanization. It's people from rural areas in Asia and Africa moving into cities. Then there are people moving between countries for two reasons. First is refugees, because they have war. And anywhere where you have a war, you will go to the neighboring country. If you are very poor in Central African Republic and South Sudan, you go to the neighboring country. If you have a little more resources, you may go on to another part of the world if it looks very hopeless in your home country. That is the refugees. Then there are the people who come for jobs. We can call them migrants. That's another thing. There are some little overlap between these groups, but, but that's really the big difference. And, and, and what you are concerned, the big thing is that this billion up here, North America and West Europe, they are not used to people coming in the numbers we see now. Whereas, whereas neighboring countries to war, like Tanzania, have received so many refugees. Iran has received refugees from Afghanistan. You know. Pakistan have refugees from, from Afghanistan. It's just that this group is not used to it. We've had people in smaller numbers coming. Now they're coming in bigger numbers. And so what can you tell us about the way our resources are being spent on refugees? Well, looking at numbers, you know, and thinking about realities behind the numbers, it's appalling that the international community don't make money available for UNHCRs, United Nations Commission for Refugees. They get one pound a day per refugee in the Middle East today. Those Syrian families who have made it across the border to Lebanon and Jordan, they're one pound a day. It's not enough for school, for kids. They have even cut food rations there. Whereas when someone comes from Syria and they come up, up to Europe, now the countries who receive most is Germany and Sweden, you know, then the cost per day is 50 times more, five zero. And that means that 
the smaller part of the refugees, we are talking about up to 5% of the refugees from the Middle East that makes it to the European Union, they use 90 to 95% of the resources. And the large chunk of, of people who can't afford the trip, they may want to come, but they can't afford, they get very few resources. Because in a strange way, West Europe has made a dangerous, costly trip for them to pass where they have to go with informal transporters, you know, which is dangerous boats. And why are the boats dangerous? Because Europe destroys the boats when they arrive. They are disposable boats. And if they make it to Europe, then Europe is kind. They say, we have the kind hand here. We take care of people. The other is a fist that tries to keep them away. This is a strange behavior. And, and, and I'm fine with people coming to my country. I say Sweden would be unbearable without immigrants. And, and just the, uh, the other day, Sweden was celebrating a child refugee who came to Sweden from Bosnia. He's called Slatan Ibrahimovic. He's one of the best footballers in Europe. And he scored against Denmark and made it for the Swedish team to the European Union. That's due to the war in Bosnia. And that he got a decent life in Sweden. He's our hero now. So, so it can be beneficial in the future, but now it's a cost. And, and it doesn't make sense that Europe use all its resources for the people who make it to Europe. We have to help out in countries like Jordan, like uh, Lebanon, and even Turkey now is getting a fair deal. If Europe don't want Turkey to, to, to uh, enable people to come here, Europe have to help Turkey. And I've also seen you explain another fact a lot of people don't know, which is why people are drowning on boats rather than flying. Yes, it's because Europe is with this hand trying to stop people to reach the right for asylum. Europe has a, a right for asylum that is so generous that we can't allow people to use it. Uh, we don't allow our, our embassies, like the British embassy and the Swedish embassy in Beirut. They can't go in there and apply for a visa and asylum. They have to go for an informal travel here. They are not allowed on the airplane. They are not allowed on the ferry boats. There are ferries from Turkey to these Greek islands. It costs 20 euro. You can buy the ticket on the internet. Go and look and you can see. So we make it so risky. So only those who are pretty desperate can come. And we make it so costly. So it's only those who are better off who can come. And that's very unwise because who does this money go to? This is what some call them smugglers. I show, call them informal transporters. It's go back to people who deal with criminals. Even the so-called Islamic State may be involved in those travels and earn money on them. It's not clever to do it like that. Enable people to fly those who are allowed to come, and they will come with their money, and they can pay for their rent the first year instead of wasting that money. You spend all your time, really, telling people facts, yes. facts that aren't commonly known. If policymakers spent more time on facts, how much better do you think the world could be? I think it's not only the policymakers, it's the public at large. You have finally to tell the British audience that we have two child families almost across the world. The problem is the poorest billion. That is where, where help is needed, aid is needed, very much into, to the poorest here. Those in the middle are managing quite well on their own. So it's the public at large, and, and it's, it's the politicians, you see, can't do things that the public don't support, because these democracies, they have to be re-elected. So I think it's a very heavy responsibility for us in the teaching institutions, I'm a professor, and for you in the media to be better at updating the worldview. In Gapminder, we call it factfulness. We want to go beyond mindfulness, you know. We want people to be factful. It's the relaxing habit of only carrying opinion that are based on facts.